we we went into this with the assumption that they were directly beneath the pedestal. Uh, that's what we thought until Monday. And uh, when we were doing some of the excavation work, we uncovered what is referred to as a Victorian cradle. And uh, you'll see them in a lot of old cemeteries where uh, it's a, a granite, it looks like a bathtub, about the size of a bathtub, and people would plant flowers in it. They unearthed that, um, and the construction crew, excavation crew, did not know exactly what that was. Uh, I was on site, recognized it immediately. Uh, we stopped the excavation, did a, uh, a probe just beneath where that uh, Victorian cradle was, and we determined that we had reasonable expectations the vaults were directly beneath there. Uh, we continued to work a little bit more, and that's when we uncovered uh, both Mr. and Ms. Uh, General Forrest and his wife's um, vaults. And from there, it really became more almost like an archaeological excavation site so that we could preserve the remains and get them uh, removed safely uh, and, and in a dignified way. Unfortunately, nobody left us architectural plans or, 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 or diagrams or anything about uh, how it was here. So we had to research into newspaper accounts, uh, the minutes of the Forest Monument Association, along with the Sons of Confederate Veterans, and uh, diaries and letters of uh, people who were witnesses who were here to try and determine the exact uh, location. And everyone said, yes, it's under the, under the pedestal or it's under the plaza. They were actually where they were supposed to be, and uh, that they were, the vaults were intact. And uh, so the, the family was very pleased that uh, it had gone so well, and the entire process has gone so well, too. So, uh, yeah, the, the, we've been in close contact with the family. Um, some of them have been here, in addition to myself. Uh, so they were glad to see this all, uh, all taking place uh, securely and, and, and reverently as it was. And again, Mr. Miller and I may agree on history, but what we can agree on is we're happy for this day. We're happy that we were able to get this done. Uh, his side is satisfied, our side is satisfied, and hopefully, again, this will be an example for Memphis to move forward in the future. Yes, my name is Lee Miller. I'm the spokesman for the area Sons of Confederate Veterans and a member of the Forrest family. Uh, of course, uh, being described as an untutored genius, never went to West Point, yet he won every single battle he was in, uh, that he was in command. Uh, so he had just an incredible war record, uh, just a natural genius on the battlefield and uh, uh, was able to, to be, be outnumbered yet would out fight uh, the opposition. Uh, so just a great military leader. But after the war, uh, just as importantly, he built, he, he strove to rebuild Memphis and the South. He started the Memphis and uh, Selma Railroad, which would connect with Mobile to connect Memphis to the Gulf. Um, he was vice president of uh, Planters Insurance Company, which became Union Planters Bank and ultimately Regents Bank, to help rebuild the South with crop loans, business loans, um, just just many, many things to help the businesses in the Mid-South. Uh, in the railroads, also uh, was president of the Memphis and Little Rock Railroad to build rail connections to the West. And uh, he hired 400 black laborers, black railroad men, to help build that. And the, the midpoint is just about uh, where Forest City is. That's named after him, Forest City. And those black railroad workers named it, named that city in his honor because he put them, put them to work. He was putting black and whites to work after the war. So uh, probably the, one of the first white civil rights workers Memphis ever had to promote uh, black rights, black welfare, black employment. There's a lot of things that people don't know about him. He was elected as an honorary deacon of one of the black churches in Memphis because he was so well respected. Um, he had 65 black cavalrymen in his cavalry. He understood the black men could fight just as well as the white men could and uh, you know recruited them as soldiers and they of course they fought. They fought for the South. Um, but uh, the, the big myth about him being the leader of the Klan. He was never in the Klan. Uh, so that's just perpetuated. It was, it was as a, a recruiting drive, really, by a later Klan that said, well, you know, General Forrest would have joined, you should join. And so it just kind of morphed into that he was the leader. But he was never the leader of the Klan, yet people don't know that. They go back to, uh, sure, he was the leader. But th there's no basis, in fact, for that. Did but that, he but found he gets, it? No, he was not a founder. No, 
it was founded by uh, six ex-Confederate men in uh, Pulaski, Tennessee. He was not the first leader. He was not ever a leader and not ever a member. In 1871, the United States Congress conducted a congressional investigation of the Klan and interviewed scores of people about the Klan activities. And in that investigation, one of their conclusions was that General Forrest was not the leader of the Klan and was never a member of the Klan. He was in the slave trade business from 1852 to, to 58, about six years, and then got out. He got out before the war started. So, uh, I'm, so they play that up real big. Of course, 11 of our first 14 presidents were slave owners as well, but it was just you know part of the times back then. But they use that as a big point to criticize uh, General Forrest. In 1875, he was so well respected in Memphis and throughout the Mid-South that the uh, organization of pole bearers, which was the predecessor to the NAACP, invited him to be the guest speaker at the Memphis Fairgrounds at their big, uh, big, big convention, uh, basically. And so he was the first white man ever invited to speak to the NAACP or the Pole Bearers Association, as it was known then. And he gave a great speech on being brothers with the black community, that they could come to him for help if they were ever downtrodden. And he would help them out, and in fact, followed up his words with that. But it was a very good speech on reconciliation and brotherhood between the black community and the white community. And everybody uh, certainly respected him and believed that. Uh, so it was just a, a, another example of General Forrest trying to help uh, both races particularly the black race, get on their feet. I tell people every, that every chance I get, but it's just overwhelmed by the, uh, the ridiculous uh, claims that uh, uh, uneducated people make about General Forrest. His funeral was attended by thousands and thousands of people, and there were 3,000 black citizens attended the funeral of General Forrest. They had the viewing the night before, and the, the black citizens were lined up. There were 500 of them in line to go see uh, General Forrest's uh, body the, the night before the funeral. He was so well respected and, and liked and a friend to the, to the black community. Uh, so he had uh, just thousands of them came to his funeral. Southern newspapers have documented this, that there were 3,000 black citizens at his funeral. Uh, at the statue raising in, uh, uh, later on in 1905, uh, that there were thousands of, of black Memphians here to honor General Forrest uh, when the statue went up. So, uh, yeah, there are numerous accounts of that, but people choose not to read those and uh, not to remember those.